So hi everybody, I am Peter Schwartz and I am the director of the IU Center for Bioethics and more relevant for this talk, the director of the Bioethics and Subject Advocacy Program at the Indiana CTSI. And we are here at the next installment of our TREATS seminar series, Translational Research Ethics Applied Topics of Research Seminar Series. And this week, this month, we are very, very lucky to have Dr. Mark Fox here. Dr. Mark Fox is the Associate Dean and the Director of the IU School of Medicine at Delta. And he is the Bioethics and Subject Advocacy Program's liaison at the School of Medicine at South Bend and at Notre Dame for us. Uh, he helps us and researchers there with ethical issues that arise from translational research. And so, if you are listening to this now or later from the South Bend campus or from Notre Dame, please know that Dr. Fox is available for you to work on research ethics topics. Today, Dr. Fox will speak to us. Actually, do not know the title because he has not brought slides because he is. Um, going to give a pure talk here without slides, but I believe the title is the role and the need when we need a uh, provider in the setting of a clinical trial. He will correct us and give me the proper title in a moment. Again, it's a great pleasure to have you, um, Dr. Fox. Thanks for that introduction. So the I don't remember the official title either. I didn't do slides because I ended up just reading text off slide, and I assume. Um, so I figured instead we'll talk through some issues. It's really focused on um, you know, clinical research by non-clinicians and what do we need to do to safeguard human subject protection. And you know, I think at the outset there are probably a couple of caveats. Um, one about the nature of clinical research generally, and then um, also it's not the I guess it's not the full scope of clinical research that gets my attention, so we ought to constrain that a little bit. And I'm not trying to besmirch non-clinicians either. So I, you know, I'm not trying to cast dispersions at anyone. Um, so I want to try to whittle down what I, what issues it is that I'm really trying to focus. So to start with, you know, if you look at um, Kind of different definitions of clinical research. Um, even across the NIH institutes, they don't really have a, a unified definition. So years ago, my previous position, I was appointed as the Associate Dean for Research Development and Director of our kind of branch program of our, um, our clinical research center, uh, our GCRC. Um, and I remember a number of disparaging comments from some of my colleagues. Um, they said they range from either, oh great, they made an ethicist the, the dean for research, so as as if that constitutes a problem in itself. Um, and huh, it sure would be nice to have a, somebody who actually does clinical research as the director of the Center for Clinical Research. So granted, uh, I mean I certainly have done um, clinical trials. Um, most of my work over the last 15 years has either been in research ethics or um, community health research and especially uh, epidemiology and social and behavioral research. So, so it just betrayed the fact that they didn't view social and behavioral research or epidemiology research as clinical research. So, <clears throat> So I want to get at kind of how clinical, what is it that is clinical about clinical research or what, it, what are the things that give me pause about clinical research by non clinicians So epidemiology research, things like that, and I'm not, not so worried about that. I'm thinking about, yeah, their, their default was it's not really clinical research unless you're giving them a medicine and assessing that intervention or cutting into them, you know, there had to be some some intervention like that that they're assessing. Um, so for my colleagues in Tulsa, I think that was the bias that they brought. And so I think that brings us to a, a second caveat is you know, for those of us who work in or have spent a lot of time around medical schools and academic health centers, um, these issues may not be as prominent. So now, you know, I'm at a regional campus, so we don't have 
all the accoutrements of a big academic health center. But we have basic scientists doing lab research. We have students. We have you know postdocs, and we don't have an army of clinical faculty that are full time at the medical school. So clinical research in South Bend is largely done out in the hospitals and not at the, the medical school per se. But a bigger challenge is to be at a place like our next door neighbor, University of Notre Dame, who I get really tired of them saying, well, since we don't have a medical school, since we don't have a medical school, since we don't have a medical school, they have a 50 year partnership with the medical school that was in the basement of their psychology building for 35 years. And now it's literally across the street from the main gate. When they say, since we don't have a medical school, what they're really bemoaning is the lack of um, an entity with a clinical practice that provides you know, 500,000 patient visits a year and sitting on mountains and mountains and mountains of, of patient data. That's what they're really wishing that they had access to. And I is my interpretation more than anything. But the challenge I want to focus on is you have faculty at um, a research-oriented institution that doesn't have you know, armies of clinicians running around in long white coats and with stethoscopes. And so what challenges arise in that context? Um, so the other, the other piece I, comment I want to make, again, is not trying to cast aspersions at I guess non-physicians doing research because I certainly don't think that that guarantees any um, either better you know, intellectual quality to the research or any better human subjects protections. Um, but there are certain things that I think just arise or are more likely to arise in kind of the milieu of an academic medical center um, that for those living and working there it would be easy to take for granted until you get plunked in a cornfield. <laughs> so, um, and, you know, an example of this came up for me again at my previous institution, there were, I think there were four different IRBs. You know, one was all about cancer clinical trials and another was all about social and behavioral research. And then a couple others in the middle kind of did a grab bag of things. And where your protocol went for review was ostensibly determined largely by the discipline of the PI. And, you know, I couldn't, a, a lot of my collaborators were social work, human relations, psychologists, architects. They always wanted me to be the PI. And I'm like, okay, well, you know, maybe I'm fine with that. Um, it was because, even though a lot of it was social and behavioral research, if it went to an IRB largely populated by clinicians, the same bias I suggested at the outset is it doesn't really count as clinical research if you're not doing something heinous to people um, and assessing the impact. Um, but you know, as long as you're not giving them chemotherapy, we're not really going to be too worried about the risks associated with this. Whereas if it went to the board that was social and behavioral research populated by sociologists and psychologists, they could spend a lot of time, you know, perseverating about the trauma induced by certain questions about trauma, for instance. So a lot of our work on average childhood experiences, the psychologists would worry about the harm we might be perpetrating with cancer, not trauma. Okay, so that's why I was the PI in all these programs. So um, even within, you know, an academic center, um, there are certain pitfalls, I think, that exist. There are certain times that obviously physicians uh, and other clinicians can have blinders on. So I think that tries to set the stage. What I'm really thinking about is um, at least the limited scope of clinical research where we're doing something with or to human subjects, um, but that are done by people who are not physicians. So I'll try and give that some context. But I think there are really uh, a couple of areas where we have to be attentive to the clinical implications of those types of research uh, 
activities. So, so broadly, I think they relate to kind of the, the protocol design itself, um, to the procedures that are proposed in the context of the protocol, and then um, secondarily is how do we respond to adverse events or unanticipated problems. And then lastly, Peter asked me not to talk about this, so I'm, <laughs> I'm definitely going to talk about uh, what to do with incidental findings. Um, so Peter's going to talk more about that later, and he doesn't want me to upstage him. So I will just make a passing reference to that. Um, <clears throat> so again, thinking about a situation where um, clinical research done by non-physicians, especially in the setting uh, outside of a hospital or academic medical school, center or medical school. Um, so where you don't have an army of clinicians around um, either in planning or evaluating or implementing these programs. So as an example, um, you know, transcranial magnetic stimulation research done by psychologists, many of whom have trained in academic medical centers or medical schools. So they, they have had, again, all the, the trappings that go with that. And now we're at an institution where they're not practicing in that same context, and they're doing the same kinds of research. Um, the IRB may or may not have kind of content expertise or sophistication even to know the, what kinds of, of human subjects, risks they ought to be um, thinking about or, or looking for. Um, and so there's the risk that the IRB takes at face value whatever the investigator says. This is a low risk procedure. Well, you're not cutting into somebody's brain, you're not doing brain biopsies, so you know, what's the assessment of the risk? And does the look, risk look different if it happens in the context of an academic health center where you've got everything around you, again, versus if you're in uh, you know, an undergraduate uh, institution of higher education. So, um, and I think this relates to, you know, the, the screening process. So thinking about the kinds of questions that we might ask to, to determine whether someone is eligible to participate in, uh, in a particular research protocol. Um, if your workforce is made up largely of undergraduate research assistants, maybe a handful of graduate research assistants who have no clinical training at all, and yet they're asking a variety of questions about your past medical history or, or you know, clinical status. Um, I don't know, have you taught first-year medical students physical oh. diagnosis and stuff? Yeah. You know, so you're teaching first-year medical students how to take a history, um, and they can't at that stage, you can't ferret out what are the additional questions that you need to ask. So if you say, do you have any history of heart disease? Well, does that mean have you had surgery on your heart? Have you ever been diagnosed with anything funny? Has your heart ever fluttered or flip-flopped in your chest? You know, what do we mean? And do you carry a diagnosis? Um, so what's the rationale for asking the question? What is the risk that you're trying to avoid? I don't feel confident that I could convey that to first-year medical students. I feel even less confident that I could convey it to an undergraduate research assistant. Um, so, you know, in a TCMS protocol, one of the risks is seizures. And so screening question is, do you have any history of seizures? Do you take any antidepressants? Uh, so, you know, mania um, is another potential risk of, of transcranial magnetic stimulation. So, so if you ask, do you take any antidepressants? No, um, you know, but I take Wellbutrin to help me quit smoking, right? So, <laughs> you know, again, medical students won't necessarily know that that has an impact on seizure threshold, that it's used for antidepressive effects as well as smoking cessation effects. So unless you have a really robust mechanism for cross-referencing medication classes, and off-label uses and all sorts of things, it'd be really easy to, to miss some things. So again, it has to be clear why these questions matter um, and 
how much detail you need to go into in trying to kind of ferret out these questions. So, uh, you know, medications and reports of uh, medical history, uh, if they matter in the screening process, how do we ensure that, you know, there's enough training for the staff implementing the protocol um, and appreciation for what's at stake? So again, in the TCMS, um, you know, the Bible of TCMS guidelines, um, it suggests that, you know, depending on the protocol that's used and, and what's being evaluated, they have some guidelines on in what setting they should be done, what should be done in the hospital setting, what should be done in an outpatient medical setting versus what should be done elsewhere. But it clearly suggests that there should be a physician involved, someone with expertise in this area involved in not initially conducting the protocol, but at least involved in protocol development and the plan. So another, um, so, you know, the, the screening elements that, go, that are outlined in, in the protocol itself is one area, and then the procedures that are implemented. So um, again, to draw on a, another example, um, was an engineering professor doing um, diffuse optical spectroscopy um, for gathering data about tissues, brain and, and vascular tissue. So it's essentially the same technology that goes into a pulse oximeter. Um, so trying to advance that to think about how do we assess tissue composition in these other settings. So it's not for clinical application yet. It's really just describing those characteristics. Um, but screening questions that ask about vascular disease, um, things like that. Again, same questions about how much sophistication or, you know, why do these questions matter? What is it you're trying to avoid? And being clear about that, who should not be allowed to participate in this research? And then the protocol um, called for measuring, you know, this activity in, in distal tissues following inflation of a blood pressure cuff to 200 or up to 220 milliliters of mercury and leaving it inflated for up to five minutes. Um, so, you know, the, the scientific rationale for doing that um, isn't articulated, but what the real risk is of that, the greatest risk is somebody saying, oh my God, this is too damn tight to turn this thing off. Um, Nothing in the consent form that outlines that as a risk. Um, no real sense of, other than people with documented vascular disease, who else might not, might we want to exclude from participating in this? Um, so, you know, certainly there's nothing in the protocol to suggest um, either an appreciation of the experience for the human subject undergoing that. I wouldn't want a blood pressure cuff inflated to 200 millimeters of mercury on for 30 seconds. I mean, that's pretty darn uncomfortable. Um, but then, you know, I think the screening question for that was, um, is there any reason you shouldn't have blood pressure measured in one area or the other? So, you know, breast cancer, somebody who's had lymph node dissection, things like that. Um, somebody with a hemodialysis, an AV fistula or something. Um, but again, it, it, you know, if we ask patients what medicines they're on, what they're for, or what they've had done, very often they can't report that in the most reliable way. And it can take a, an experienced clinician to try and tease that out and understand uh, what their what are, the, what are the things we're most worried about that we want to ensure that they have, have not had uh, that would be a, a grounds for exclusion? So uh, again, I don't feel confident that med students could do that reliably, even less confident that somebody without any clinical training at all. So, um, you know, really reviewing what the procedures are, what the, what the potential um, risk to the human subject is, but also ensuring that the staff are adequately trained to do that. Um, the second category is 
that I want to think about are you know, adverse events or unanticipated problems. Uh, so again, back to uh, an example from the TCMS protocol. Uh, reports of, of two otherwise healthy um, college-age females that have participated in the protocol. Um, and lightheadedness is, is one of the risks that's documented associated with um, transcranial magnetic stimulation. Um, in, in one report, um, the young woman was instructed to put her head down between her legs and take some deep breaths. And in another one, she was laid back, um, not on a stretcher, but in a chair that partially reclined and was given orange juice and crackers. Um, and I presume that the orange juice and crackers was to treat presumptive hypoglycemia. Um, but I'm not sure whoever implemented those responses to um, these side effects really had a clear plan of what they were intervening to address or that they'd been given any training about what the protocol should be. Um, so thinking about, uh, you know, whether we're treating hypoglycemia or presyncope, um, and thank God neither of those were seizures because what? <laughs> At least in that case, they might've called 911 or something. Um, so then the, the last category I wanna think about, and, and again, I'm not gonna go deep into this, but um, you know, there are some unique incidental findings issues. So again, back to the engineering uh, diffuse optical spectroscopy study that had the blood pressure cuff for five minutes. Um, they wanted to record the heart rate and they suggested that they were gonna use an EKG to determine the heart rate. Um, and a different place in the protocol it talked about an EKG machine versus an Apple Watch versus by palpation or auscultation or something. Um, so, you know, if, if you use an EKG machine and your purpose is simply to get a heart rate, um, most EKG machines will give you a presumptive diagnosis up there that says, you know, based on your age and gender, uh, this is possible ischemia, right? So, so you might get a lot more than just the heart rate. Um, and unless you have a clear plan of what you're going to do with that, and I would suggest that ignoring that, um, if you're going to get that information, you probably shouldn't ignore it. Even if it doesn't preclude them from participating in the protocol, when I think about human subjects protection and thinking you know, that individual dropped dead of an MI a month later and come back to find that, oh, they participated in this research protocol, and here's an EKG that says, probable myocardial ischemia. Uh, at the very least, we ought to feel bad about that, but I think we also ought to do more to protect you. And maybe the better way to protect them is to bury your head in the sand and you know, not use that modality to, to assess the heart rate if all you really need is the heart rate. So um, you know, my Garmin will tell me what my heart rate is, and unless I have bigemony, it's usually right. Um, so, um, you know, really thinking about what is the data you need and restricting your focus to that data, particularly in a non-clinical context where there aren't people running around with the expertise to tell you how to interpret. So that's all I'm going to say about incidental findings. Um, so stay tuned for your remarks till later. <laughs> I just got what I deserve. I <laughs> built it up now, so now I, I, I deserve all of that. So thank you. No, well, you set the bar pretty high. I, I so did. You don't need me to. This is the bottom. Um, so, but when I think about, especially that last protocol with the EKG machine, um, as we discuss these, these issues, I'm thinking to a casual observer who goes into a lab to participate in this research protocol, and there are people walking around with white coats, and there's an EKG machine there, and there's a gurney there, and there's a stethoscope and a blood pressure cuff. That looks for all the world like these people know what they're doing in a clinical sense. And so, you know, we, we worry a lot about therapeutic misconception in terms of is there therapeutic benefit to participating in research and trying to you know, disabuse people of that notion. 
but also just in the way that we present ourselves. Um, it may create an expectation for a level of expertise around clinical matters that frankly doesn't exist. So what are the safeguards? You know, so these are the elements that I think we need to be attentive to um, in clinical research, in outside of clinical contexts, um, where we need to make sure that there has been careful consideration of those clinical implications. But I also think it's, a, it's important to think about it um, as if we're the human subject coming to participate in this and what expectations get created in our mind by the very way this is, is presented. Um, in fact, maybe that needs to be an explicit part of the consent process. This looks very much like the doctor's office, kind of like our model patient program. <laughs> this looks very much like a doctor's visit, but it's not. This is a medical student who's learning uh, to conduct the doctor's visit. So, how do we set the stage for that encounter uh, in, a, in a way that it at least does as best we can to ensure that the expectations of the research subject match um, kind of what the output of this will be and what kinds of, of expertise they can expect to encounter and to what extent does that promote the protection of human subjects. So, I mean, I'll stop there. Uh, I just wanted to kind of plant those seeds, but really want to hear your thoughts about you know, what are the challenges associated with you know, these types of clinical research outside of the clinical context. Yeah, I'll start. Uh, are there any cases where you'd be worried about having the wrong type of clinician? So you talk about brain imaging and uh, cardiovascular issues. There'd be an issue where a clinician says, Oh, yeah, I know about the medical basics. Uh, and so they're overconfident, maybe, and say, You know, I'll probably provide my advice on brain imaging when actually I know nothing about you know, the science. Yeah, that's a great question. And I certainly don't think it's um, unique to these non clinical contexts. So, um, yeah, a good friend of mine is a neonatologist who was brought in to consult for the IRB around a neonatology protocol um, because there was no one on the IRB populated with lots of, lots of physicians and including pediatricians, um, but nobody who felt like they had kind of the physiological and clinical expertise to address issues in that particular subject. So, so I think it's a risk here as much as it would be anywhere. Um, but I think part of what I heard you say was, you know, kind of the risk of uh, either, you know, the clinician or, or particularly of someone else overestimating yeah. the level of content expertise they have uh, around particular issues. And I'll say, you know, so I uh, have consulted on a number of these protocols. I'm not a neurologist. I have no particular expertise there. I have no psychiatric expertise. Um, and so, you know, I end up going back and doing the literature review to say, you know, what, what are the risks that have been documented in this? The interesting thing is when my literature review driven assessment of risks is very different than the PI who wrote the, the IRB protocol. Um, across the board, at least to date, they've underestimated risk compared to what I've found in the literature. And so, Navigating that discrepancy has been challenged, so I'm generally viewed as a pain in the ass. So. <laughs> and, and it might be that somebody with more actual clinical expertise in that domain would say, "Yeah, it's reported in the literature," but uh, so so they might do better to have someone with you know more sophisticated content expertise in those areas than me going to the literature to say, "This is what I." Be kind of building on talking about risk and who determines risk. Um, how does that kind of gray area lead into and affect the informed consent process? How does that you know, then affect participants and knowing what they're getting into? <laughs> yeah, again, I think you know the risk. One of the risks that I see at kind of the operational level of the IRB is. Um, 
you know, to, for lack of a better term, to a casual observer, it might look like, yeah, all the I's are dotted, all the T's are crossed, this looks pretty complete. So again, back to the prior example, if the, if the PI reports, you know, the adverse events are, you know, vanishingly rare, um, and they write a consent form that kind of conveys it that way, um, for a lot of IRBs, there's not going to be anyone to counter that or, or to question it. Um, and, and I think that's a potential blind spot for all sorts of IRBs. At the same time, you don't want to induce hysteria because, you know, everything could do, right? And so the phlebotomy, uh, you know, I always ask med students to spin out the scenario in which a patient dies from reaching phlebotomy. Uh, because it certainly can happen from infection or from a bleeding disorder or from somebody developing syncope and hitting their head and having a traumatic brain injury. So I can spin at least three scenarios right there, um, probably more. Um, so you don't want to invoke hysteria, but I think you need to be at least reasonably prepared both for the kinds of adverse experience, adverse events that could arise and the prospective research subjects need to be aware of that and be aware of how you're prepared to respond. But I think finding that, um, finding the right match for those things, again, is more likely to happen in a large academic center where you have you know, lots of different kinds of content expertise from you. Uh, that is not likely to happen at, a, at an institution not affiliated with your clinical practice or, you know. Okay, so, so I'm going to try to summarize a little bit and then I'm going to ask some additional questions. So summarizing, I think what you're saying, I want to know how wrong It's um, there's a clinical interaction going on, screening, procedures, adverse event response. A clinician should be involved in the planning and evaluation of the protocol and just potentially in the, in the actual clinical setting, the clinical research setting. So really we should find ways to get the clinicians involved at those levels. And the mistake that might be made would be to not. Yeah. Is that one way to say it? <coughs> okay, great. And I guess I was focusing on, when I asked you, I think it's one of you took the board when I was thinking, we had a conference about a case, I won't go into detail of the case, but the question was, when does the providers have to be present in the room during the clinical trial? Like, how close, which clinician? And I, I, again, kudos, wonderful, I love that you went broader to planning, evaluation, IRB, Exactly the right way to think of that. I've learned a lot. How about that that very narrow question, though? Take you back to it. Was there anything to say about it other than if it's serious enough, you need a clinician. If it's not too serious, maybe not. If it's really serious, get a licensed clinician. Do you have anything to say about that sort of area of actually in the room, something's happening, maybe transcranial magnetic stimulation, which I think is the case that you talked about once, has come up a couple times uh, at DSAP. Um, what, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah. So. Um, you know, I think if we were to, to say that you have to have uh, a clinician you know, in the room to do it, it would shut down a lot of research, probably unnecessarily. Yeah. So I think the risks are relatively low that they're... So I think that a, I would like to see the clinician involved on the front end, both in terms of, you know, the development of the screening process and development of you know, robust procedures for responding to untoward events. Um, again, if it's a seizure, you know, if a seizure is a foreseeable risk, then the undergraduate research assistant needs to have something that they can rely on. Of how should I respond, you know, after I've called 911 or, or what have you. Um, so what are the things, what are the worst outcomes that you can foresee that we ought to be prepared for? And then what are the most common things that we ought to be prepared for so that we're not sticking one person's head between their knees and treating presumptive hypoglycemia. Um, <laughs> that is anyway. where so, 
that's definitely not happening, right? <laughs> I, I loved also the talk how in the few cases you gave for the clinicians listening, in each case, the clear error being made was painfully obvious to us clinicians, nurses, doctors, others listening to the talk. Um, where then the non clinician made for the case like, oh yeah. Um, inflating a blood pressure cuff at 250, what's wrong with that? It's a number, I've heard that number. Whereas us docs and nurses who've inflated a cuff at 250, I know that people start to look very uncomfortable in 10 seconds, much less five minutes. And I love that case because I think, and the IRBs that I've been on, uh, and I'm at a med school of so many IRBs, that could make it through uh, easily. Just it's just on one line. And if any of us went to CBS, and it put our arm in the machine, oh and it was in 200 and didn't move, we'd be hitting the <laughs> yeah. abort, abort, abort right. button. So. so I love that example. Um, I'll just ask one more. Uh, well, my job is done here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, before I ask more questions, anybody else have questions about this? I actually thought of Karen, our, my psych coordinator, our, our coordinator is here, and I thought about the screening questions. Is it excellent? I guess I didn't foresee you talking about it at all, and I agree 100% that. It again is something that can easily be missed. But I feel like, oh, ask them if they're on an antidepressant. There are all kinds of medications that might be classified as such, each has their own risk profiles. And of course, the right way to do this is have a script, much like we have in our own study, where there's a script where the questions and the possible answers are all find out ahead of time. And different answers lead to different follow up questions. And if you're going to have an RA who is uh, maybe just graduated from college or is a you know, public health student, maybe, they aren't going to know those follow-up questions. And a clinician, I think, probably a clinician, has to be involved to know what to follow up. Your example, again, was wonderful. Is Wolfutrin is a great example of one which a lot of clinicians would know, oh, it's dangerous. Now, if you're not a clinician, you probably just know the full FDA product insert, which is 30 things. But if you're a clinician, or if you have a friend on Wolfutrin, you know that it actually really happened. It's not a theoretical thing at all. And so if you're doing a, a uh, protocol and any kind of increased risk of procedures, that has to be zeroed in on identified. Um, again, wonderful example for the clinicians who all went, ooh, said, well, what well, fusion is perfect for that. So, I don't know if there's a question for that. Yeah. I have a question that way. Last one. Uh, well, no, I, no. let me respond no. to that, though, because, you know, I somewhere in my mind, I, I really believe that Some of these PIs, as I said, trained, likely trained in a place where there was a medical school and there were lots of clinicians around. And they basically just replicated the same protocol. And so is it true that the same protocol implemented in you know, Indianapolis looks different than the same protocol implemented at Wabash College, you know, where there's not a med school there, there aren't clinicians running around, um, you know. So, so what is it about that context that's different? And, and is it that there are at least possibly clinicians on the IRB that would say, huh, we probably need to be a little more careful about that. That might be the case in Indianapolis and that expertise may not exist, you know, in the middle of the cornfield. Um, and, and is it partly a Dunning-Kruger effect that they, they, they're they overconfident um, about being able to translate a protocol from an academic medical center to a non-clinical setting? Um, and I suspect there may be a bit of that as well. So in, on a setting, as you say, where there are fewer clinicians around, and you, as an MD, is often called upon or have to make back and forth more than that period. And I guess a CTSI, you could think, should, maybe does, have the resources to say, you're a non-clinician, let's get you hooked up with some clinicians who can help you. Our CTSI has done that. I've been on PDTs where that's happened. An incredible PhD researcher has got a great idea to say, you know, you just need, not just for, for clinical specimens for patients you can work with, but also for clinical input and expertise on planning, even an overall project, much less the safety issues. Last one, I got a question about DSMBs. 
the data safety monitoring board is one of the um, services the bioethics so that ethics program tries to help with planning those. I find a lot of times people running clinical trials come to us and say there's a lot of risk in this trial, we'd love to have an ethicist on. And as soon as I push back, so I'm very lazy, I refuse to do work. No, because often what they need is actually clinical expertise on the DSMB. Like if it's a trial involving, say, you know, cardiac rhythm, they need to have a cardiologist specializing rhythm on that DSMB, because I, as an ethicist, I have nothing to say about the weird rhythms I've seen. Maybe I'm just a general medicine doc and like, yeah, that's not a fit, so I don't know what it is. <laughs> so I don't know, but it's very interesting. Like, how much expertise do you expect in DSMB? This is again a question of balancing risk reduction and evaluation against barriers to getting clinical research done. It's becoming very hard to find people with you know, excellent uh, experience. Yeah, that's that's a good question because um, For the DSMB, you're right. The issue is is not in the first instance an ethical issue. Uh, it is it's a practical clinical expertise issue. Um, but it's really an epidemiologic issue. Is, is this clinical entity happening more than we would predict that it should? So, 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 yeah, I, I think you need a statistician informed by the clinician more than anything. And in fact, in, you know, in one of these protocols where there were a number of um, lightheaded college age females um, and more than would have, more than a reasonably informed clinician would expect based on literature reports and, and more than we would expect based on kind of general sense of interacting with college-age females, um, you know, finger in the wind said, yeah, this is more common than we would expect. So is this a problem with screening? Is it something related to the protocol? And how do we dig into it? Oh, but it's like Notre Dame, where they can't find clinicians. I guess I assume that doesn't happen so much in Notre Dame, but it's like law bashing. Um, law bash, bashing, yeah. Law bashing, yes. Um, Maybe an underlying question is, uh, do people not seek out clinicians because they're not available or because they, they worry like, oh, they're just going to come? They don't, they won't want to work with me. Yes. I, I all think all of the above. Um, so, yeah, they they don't want to pay for it generally, um, you know, unless they somehow have a, a budget for it. They certainly don't want to pay for someone else's time to involve a clinician in that. Um, you know, the clinicians running around at Notre Dame are the ones who run student health and who provide sports medicine coverage for athletic teams who are pretty busy anyway. They likely don't have any particular expertise in some of these areas. Um, and so one of the things that we've done is to try to uh, direct them towards some clinicians who do have the requisite expertise that can help them. These have all been kind of after the protocol was developed, so how do we how do we improve it? You know, after it's already been developed. Um, again, that's where if we if the med school in South Bend had a clinical practice arm, which they don't, um, then that expertise might be more readily available. But if nothing else, we can play a swizzle stick function to try and connect some people. Um, but I also think there are some. Uh, not insurmountable, but but not insignificant, um, per, at least perceived liability issues. So, in fact, you know, Notre Dame Research Compliance has gotten Notre Dame Legal Counsel involved in some things about what those arrangements with non-Notre Dame, uh, either with physicians employed by Notre Dame, what that looks like, or with clinicians with no Notre Dame. 
And in fact, Notre Dame has this really extensive national network of Notre Dame alums who bleed blue and gold, who actually would volunteer all sorts of time, probably to consult on protocols, even from a distance, just to keep that connection and to, you know, say that, yeah, I, I do research, you know, I, I consult on research in Notre Dame. Um, but, you know, they have a huge alumni network that are incredibly loyal and devoted to that of clinicians. And even though, I mean, some of the <coughs> examples you, you gave, I mean, even without a clinician, you can still have some best practices put in place, like the medication, instead of asking, are you on antidepressants, just what medications are you taking? I don't know how far back, six months ago or whatever, and and then cross-reference that. I mean, yeah, so simple kinds of steps like that I would do, whether it's in a non-clinical setting or a clinical setting as well. And, and that's where I, I think your point's right on. Um, I think that's where a clinician could say, help say, you know, how far back does it matter? Um, you know, why does it matter and how far back does it matter? But yeah, we should, the question we start with is, are you taking any medicine? What medicines are you taking? Uh, and go from there. I was thinking of Karen, I was thinking of you, Karen, when he was saying that, I thought Karen would head that off. Right, so yeah. Well, it's, it's, And then I was thinking about another example from our research, which is that I do a lot of from a general medicine doc, as everybody knows, but um, I'm sorry, I don't know if you might have to have it. But um, uh, we do work on colon cancer screening. I know plenty about that. It's a primary care interaction. We have a GI doc close to us about the Contrealia on our research team. And I am surprised often that he has clinical expertise. I do not have a graph of the latest debates about it. And it's wonderful to be part of the team. And almost I would call it. Invaluable, I can't put a value on it so high. And so, again, it's that question of who do you bring to the table? But you may not even expect the value, but it's going to show up at interesting times if you have the dialogue. And I'm now thinking of a crazy analogy, but also with our patient and partner analogy. We have this community engaged sort of setting. We have patients at the table. Sometimes I'm in a mood where I think, ah, who do you assess the patients? I know what I'm going to do. I know the assignment, the question is here. And then repeatedly, I get some views of that because I'm in a situation where it's <coughs> There they are, and it's such a valuable thing. So I think it's really that's awesome in some ways, but I think it is the narrative, the research, and the value of that in a surprising and other setting. So one comment in response to your you know, medication history thing. Um, when I first became an attending, um, I was attending on a general medicine inpatient unit, and I was on weekend coverage. So I had four resident teams and two nurse practitioner teams that I was covering. So I was rounding on about 75 patients on a Saturday. And so the residents all rounded and written their notes. I'm slogging through. So about 3.30 in the afternoon, I get to this one who's a new admission, going through a chart, and the intern had, you know, beautifully documented everything. I'm like, oh, so, you know, how long have you had a heart failure? Well, how long have you been taking, taking the jocks? What about your depression? How, you know, how are you coming? Yeah, good question. Well, how long have you been taking Stella? I don't think so. Do you have your medicine? So, grocery bag full of medicine. And I went through every single one of them. Dijoxin, oh, that Sparky the dogs. The Citalopram was the sister-in-law. So, the patient did what they were told. They brought all their medicine. They happened to bring a few other family members' medicine with it. The intern dutifully documented and ordered all of them. Um, you know, fortunately, I caught that before the order had been fulfilled. So she didn't get to Jackson or Stalin. But it's like, you know, in theory, everyone did what they were supposed to. Um, and probably if it had not been my first month of inpatient attending, I might have just taken it at face value and said, okay. Um, so, Med reconciliation. <laughs> you know, if they had said, "What medicine are you taking?" instead of just filling out the grocery bag full of medicine list, um, that might have been avoided. But I just I think about that and how lucky I was that I dodged that. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much.